Welcome to, to today's masterclass at the Good Intelligent Digital Trust World 2021. My name is Alan Good, CEO and Chief Analyst at Good Intelligence, and I shall be your host for today's masterclass. I'm joined by two members from the FIDO Alliance who will be present to us on their aims and their work. And now I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who will basically uh, present the first part of the presentation from the FIDO Alliance. Thank you, Andrew. Alan, thanks so much for having us today. Uh, again, my name is Andrew Shikiar. I'm the Executive Director and Chief Marketing Officer at FIDO Alliance. I'm joined by my colleague, David Turner. He's our Director of Standards Development. And we're going to run through um, the ins and outs of FIDO authentication for you today, uh, what we've done, and, and a little peek at what we have uh, coming ahead. So uh, for starters, here's the obligatory, you know, wow, passwords are horrible slide. Um, and you see all sorts of data here and statistics that point to the problem we have in the marketplace. Uh, with today's uh, means of user authentication. Um, you know, it's an ongoing problem. Um, it, it's been a persistent problem. And, and, and really, all these things point to uh, an ongoing rise in attacks and data breaches. And so much of this, it comes back to a dependence on shared secrets as our primary means of authentication. COVID-19 has only exacerbated things. Um, it's created a, a much uh, bigger market for hackers uh, because all of a sudden there is a, a distributed workforce, uh, there's people who were not digital natives going digital, um, which created massive opportunity for hackers. And so you see a lot of these data points um, looking, you know, pointing to the, the spike in the growth in attacks since the pandemic began. And, you know, all this comes down to the fact that passwords simply are not fit for purpose for today's networked economy. Um, I think we can all relate to the challenges as consumers and as users. Um, passwords are clumsy, they're hard to remember. Um, and if you're using them correctly, you're meant to have a, you know, a separate password for each site. Um, but ultimately, I think the biggest problem with passwords is that they sit on a server. Anything on a server can and eventually will be stolen um, because passwords, as we say here, are easy to fish and harvest and replay and stuff. Um, and you know, multi-factor authentication um, via SMS, OTPs, um, that's kind of the, has been the default form of 2FA, and, and that certainly adds security, um, but it doesn't necessarily address the, you know, the user experience factor. In fact, you know, juggling between devices and deliver, deliverability issues you know, persist. Um, and most importantly, there's still shared secrets, and as such, they're still fishable. Um, much better than a password alone, but they really are not the answer either. And in fact, this was a landscape that FIDO Alliance inherited when we launched in you know, 2012, 2013, um, there's an imperative for simpler and stronger authentication. And both two, both two of those are important aspects, right? So we obviously need to have better security than passwords alone and SMS, OTP or OTP, uh, but usability is very important as well. Because we've seen, you know, throughout history that um, the, the more difficult a form of MFA is, the lower the opt-in rates are and the higher the drop-off rates are for users. So we need to find a better way, and that's what we're doing. Now, simply put, what FIDO is doing is, is shifting the marketplace away from an outdated means of authentication that relies on server-side, human-readable shared secrets to one that's more decentralized in nature, which allows users to authenticate locally to the devices that they probably have in their hands that moment. So it's single-gesture, possession-based authentication, user-friendly, asymmetric, public key cryptography. So we did launch in 2013, you know, to address those problems. And again, you know, we're emphasizing the fast in our name, the simpler in our tagline. Um, more and more, you know, I find that when we're talking about FIDO, you can't talk about FIDO without talking about usability and user experience. Um, and so these are very important aspects um, that, that we see in, in bringing user-friendly multi-factor authentication to scale. A little, bit, a little bit about who FIDO is. Um, this is our board of directors. So we're an open industry consortia. Uh, we have around 40 something companies on our board. Uh, these are their logos. Um, really, I think what's impressive about this list of companies is that if you, you know, think about who needs to be sitting around the table together to address this problem, this is the right set of companies, all right? We have the manufacturers of devices and platforms that are you know, being used every day. Um, we have experts in biometrics and security. And last but not least, we have the service providers whose businesses are dependent upon their ability to deliver high assurance services to billions of users worldwide on a daily basis. So it's that blend of companies 
that really helps you know guide FIDO's outputs and our, and our direction. And that plan is also reflected throughout our membership base. So we have 250 organizations worldwide taking part in FIDO Alliance. We have sponsor members who build our working groups. We have associate members who help comprise uh, a lot of the FIDO certified ecosystem. Uh, we liaise with other .orgs and organizations to address joint use cases and regional education programs. And we also have government members. And so much of what we do, as we'll talk about in a bit, um, looks at regulatory um, requirements and, and, and demands. And so having government input is very important on that front. So now I'm going to turn, turn things over to David to talk about how FIDO works. David. It's Andrew. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So the FIDO approach is uh, fundamentally different from how you traditionally or how people traditionally have dealt with uh, logging onto sites using passwords. Uh, next. And the main difference is we've introduced something called an authenticator, which sits between the, the user and the service provider. And the authenticator is something that the user has full control over. So this can be a security key that they carry with them. It can be uh, embedded into, into their own device. And it becomes the intermediary between the user and the service provider. Uh, next. And what happens in the registration process is that a key pair is generated. And what you have on the authenticator side is the private key. It gives the, it's, it's paired public key to the uh, relying party so that when authentication happens, which I'll cover in a second, um, you, the, the, the relying party can verify that it is the same authenticator that was used previously. So that it always knows that it's the same user coming back to log in again. And the benefit is by using the public key cryptography approach, we don't have, as Andrew talked about earlier, we don't have, you don't have shared secrets that you have to worry about being hacked. On the relying party side, all you have is the public key. And if the relying party gets breached, um, nothing is given away. There's nothing they can do with that private key. Now, one of the things that makes the FIDO process unique as well, uh, next, is that when these keys are generated during registration, it always requires user input. So it's not possible for some third party or malware to take over the authenticator and actually start creating public private keys with websites that you're um, connected to. It always requires some kind of, as I said, user interaction. It may just be a simple touch of the key, or it could be some kind of uh, biometric uh, approach, face, finger, um, and it also supports PIN. So there's always an end user control function whenever this is being used. So that's how, uh, what happens during registration. Authenticator, uh, relying party pings the authenticator, creates the key pair. Once it gets permission from the user, public key then gets sent back to the relying party. Next. During authentication, uh, when the authenticator goes back or when the user goes back to that site, the relying party sends a challenge to the authenticator which signs it with the private key, and that sign response is sent back to the relying party, which can then validate it using the public key. And the, the process of signing the key is once again controlled by the end user. So again, you can't have some kind of automated attack on the authenticator that overrides the human interaction, so that there's always user control over the process of um, signing and replying to the relying party. And I'll also mention here, oops, go back one second, because it does come up um, again, is that uh, the, the binding, I forgot to mention this, is always between a user and authenticator and the relying party. And what that means is that um, that set is always unique for every account that you set up so that um, there's no sharing between relying parties and there's no way for a relying party to know that the same authenticator was used on another site because the keys are different. Now, next one, please. Not going to spend a lot of time on this in the next diagram. This is just a simple flow um, to show how um, what happens during first registration and then uh, authentication. During registration, the relying party sends some information over to the client, um, information about the TLS connection or any options they may want to use. It provides information like a client or sorry, a user ID so it can be identified later. This information is then sent to the authenticator. The authenticator um, signs the whole package of data, um, generates the public and private keys, and then responds back to 
the relying party by passing on that information, including the credential it created uh, from all the data, as well as the public key that will be used for verification later. Quick note on something called an attestation certificate. Note that it's in this registration process where that information is produced. And I'll get to that in a moment of why that's a, a valuable part of the FIDO uh, ecosystem. Next slide, please. So then, as we saw in the earlier um, graphic, when somebody wants to authenticate, the first thing the relying party does is it sends the challenge again to the client. Um, the uh, client side determines, um, confirms that it is an acceptable relying party so that it, it always matches the relying party uh, to the keys that were generated, which is one of the things that prevents um, phishing and man in the middle attacks because you can't, uh, the authenticator won't work if the relying party IDs don't match. Um, the challenge is then signed with the private key that was created for that relying party. And again, all that information is passed back uh, to the relying party for confirmation to make sure that yes, it was the same public key, <clears throat> pardon me, that the challenge was, was um, signed properly and so on. So you'll notice in all of this that uh, I didn't mention it again, but every time the authenticator comes into play, Again, there's always the user interaction, but there is no password flow in this at all. It's just the public keys being used on both sides. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned the um, attestation certificate. Another aspect of the FIDO uh, uh, system is that every authenticator can have this attestation object, which allows the relying party to confirm at registration that this is a legitimate key, that this isn't some hacked or um, compromised key, that it comes from the company that says they created it, uh, because a, uh, the process is that the company provides, uh, stores the information in a metadata server at registration, the relying party can check the certificate it was given with the certificate in the metadata service and confirm that it is the right authenticator from the valid party, and also learn about some of the security characteristics of the key. Uh, next, please. So. As you saw, um, the process, while well, the behind the scenes are a few steps, from an end user standpoint, the only time they came into play, whether for registration or for author, uh, author sorry, authentication, pardon me, um, was some simple gesture or some biometric uh, interaction. So we've gotten rid of the need for using the, the uh, passwords during authentication. It's a single gesture to log on. Um, it works across all common devices, and, and Andrew will be talking about that in a moment. You can use the same authenticator um, on multiple devices as well, if that's your scenario, and it's very fast and easy to use for the end user. Next. And it's also a stronger solution. It's based on public key cryptography, which is a very, very hard technology to crack. The information always stays on the device. The, uh, the private keys are never shared with anyone else. There are no server-side shared secrets. So again, if the server gets compromised, there's no useful information for the hacker to, to take advantage of. There's no third parties in the protocol. So you have less uh, parties and, and attack vectors. Um, if you have a biometric device, part of our certification program stipulates the biometric templates must never leave the device. So you have a higher level of, of trust and security there. And as I briefly touched on earlier, the, um, the fact that a new key pair is generated for every site means that there is no way for um, sites that are trying to collude together to be able to um, identify that it's the same person, same authenticator being used across uh, different sites. Uh, next. So just lastly, um, in order to build a robust ecosystem, one of the other areas that we've invested in is certification. Uh, there's a lot of information about this on our website, but we provide different levels of certification uh, to make sure that we have a robust ecosystem. The first is interop, essentially, that we want to make sure that all the devices, whether it's the hardware being used for, as the authenticator or whether it's the backend server, that they all work well together. So we have conformance testing, we have interoperability testing, and we have testing for universal servers. We also have certification level testing, which is a way of testing the authenticators themselves, the, the hardware that you're using for doing the authentication to make sure that the private key is well protected. Um, there are different levels to uh, recognize the different needs for the strong authentic, pardon me, stronger authentication, going from 
the basic level, which may be um, hardware assisted, all the way up to level three, which is um, for you know high finance, very high security uh, requirements where it gets into, um, can the hardware itself be physically hacked? So it's a whole range of, of security uh, certifications so that you can choose what you need for your scenario. And then we also have a biometric certification program. Uh, the purpose of this program is to test the certification, the, the effectiveness of the certification, or sorry, the biometric that you're going to be using for authentication. So it tests things like false acceptance rates, false reject rates, um, uh, there's protection, um, uh, presentation detection detect, uh, pardon me, presentation attack detection testing that we do as well. Um, it's easier to say pad than to say the whole thing. Uh, and so there's a variety of tests and what this does is it gives you confidence with this certification testing. It gives you confidence that the biometric components that you're using in your system um, meet a certain standard of effectiveness and security. Uh, next, Andrew. Yes, thank you, David. Um, so, you know, so that gives you some more background and context on how FIDO works and some of the underpinning uh, technologies and, and what we're doing to drive the ecosystem. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about progress we're making in the field and in the market. Um, and, and our goal, quite simply, is to become part of the web's DNA. Um, and that's because when you think about passwords, what we're trying to replace, that is part of the web's DNA, right? Passwords have been around since most people, you know, started using computers in any sort of way, shape, or form. Um, people know intuitively to look for the username password dialog box. Um, and it's just you know what we do and it's very ubiquitous. And so for us to change that, we need to actually you know, replace that part of the DNA and FIDO needs to become part of the way that the web works. So I think we have three key steps to get there. The first thing we need to do, and this probably goes for any technology for that matter. Uh, first, you need to have strong industry collaboration and then standardization of that technology. And we'll talk about each of these points in a moment. Secondly, you just need to be there, right? The kind of dial tone effect, you need to be shipping in devices and platforms at massive scale. And then third, um, I think it's very important to have strong regulatory and government embrace. And these are really the three key ingredients to, to you know, becoming part of the fabric of the web itself. So let's talk a little bit more about how we're you know, attacking these three points. Um, Oops, let's see real quick. So um, here we are in 2021, you know, as far as the second point, because you know, FIDO has been you know, very widely distributed. Um, you know, there's over you know, 800 FIDO certified products on market. Uh, there's billions of devices uh, on market. Um, and a lot of people are actually using FIDO. So we're seeing good progress um, in, in market distribution. And so, that really helps set the stage for people to deploy FIDO more widely. When it comes to industry collaboration and standardization, um, you know, we referenced before the 250 companies or so that take part inside the FIDO Alliance. And I mentioned we also liaise with third parties. And I think you know, there's no better example of that than the work we've done with W3C. Um, so several years ago, after our first set of specifications were out there, um, we were working on something called the FIDO 2.0 Web APIs. Um, and this was when we realized as an organization that to get scale, to get that pervasiveness that we're talking about, we need to address the platforms and the web. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the FIDO Alliance you know, determined that the best way to actually address the requirement to be supported in the web was to go to the standardization body of the web itself. W3C is one of our liaison partners. So we submitted our APIs and, and our specs into W3C. They formed the Web Authentication Working Group. That working group was comprised of a lot of people who take part both in FIDO Alliance and W3C. So that's where the WebAuthn um, API came from, which was then brought back into FIDO Alliance you know, as we standardized that plus our CTAP protocol, which is comprised of FIDO2 specs. But it's through that collaboration um, that, that you know, the, the benefit of that was that immediately, as soon as the spec was done, we had support for FIDO authentication in every leading web browser. Furthermore, We've seen since then, the platforms natively support FIDO. So first it was Android, and then it was Windows Hello. And then most recently, Apple has been supporting FIDO explicitly in our devices. So the net result now is that virtually any device that's being unboxed today can consume FIDO authentication. So again, that's the second key point that we need to get to to become part of the DNA of the web itself. 
And here, here's a good example of that. So again, across devices, across platforms, across operating systems. And it's little wonder then that we're seeing um, you know, more and more organizations you know, deploy FIDO. And this is a, a small subset of the companies that are you know, deploying FIDO authentication. What I'm trying to show you here is kind of the breadth and depth and, and array of use cases. Um, it, it spans uh, industries, borders, um, you know, both citizen facing, consumer facing, employee facing uh, implementations of FIDO authentication. And we talked a little bit about regulatory inputs and, and impetus. Um, you know, more and more we're seeing um, government site FIDO authentication as a preferred means to protect um, both government resources, uh, agencies, and citizens alike. And this is only growing as you know key trends in digital identity are coming to the fore as well. All right. So you look at like in Europe with the EIDAS and a lot of the interesting work around digital wallets. Well, how do you protect? the login process for that, or how do you secure those wallets? You know, authentication is a very critical part of that, and FIDO is the um, you know, only kind of industry standard focused on allowing for you know, very strong, uh, ubiquitous, and, and simple user authentication. So it's a little wonder then that we're seeing more and more governments gravitate towards FIDO to, to um, protect, again, citizens and, and applications and agencies. So all in, you know, I think we're, we're seeing great progress in all three of these points that, that we need to hit uh, to become part of the web's fabric. Um, we're seeing the standardization collaboration. Uh, we're, we're shifting at massive scale. And then we're seeing a very positive uh, regulatory guidance and government embrace of FIDO authentication. So what's this mean? What's this look like? I mean, David talked about, you know, the, the highlights before, simpler and stronger authentication. Um, this is how FIDO works. So a couple of examples here. Um, this is cross-platform login in action. Uh, eBay, eBay.com is one of the earliest adopters of FIDO. First, you see it uh, running there on a, an uh, iOS. Uh, next, you can see a login here on the big screen. Uh, this is Chrome on Mac OS. Um, some more examples. Here we have uh, Chrome on Safari. Um, and last but not least, uh, you can see a login uh, with Windows Low. Um, and Windows Hello, of course, is the, the platform authenticator on Windows 10. So, again, we've made great progress with FIDO authentication. That's been our primary goal is, you know, re reducing industry reliance on passwords. That being said, you know, for us to really reach our mission, there are adjacent work areas that we need to address to you know, prevent kind of some back doors that hackers would, would seek to exploit. And so I'm going to turn things back over to David to talk about our adjacent work in identity and IoT. David. So the first area I'm going to cover is identity verification and binding. Next slide, please. So why, we were, why, why did FIDO get into the whole area of, of identity verification? Well, um, while FIDO has a lot of strengths, there's still a challenge of, well, what happens if I lose my FIDO authenticator? Whether it's an external device or perhaps built into, say, a phone, um, how do I re-authenticate myself in a secure manner? Falling back to some of the you know, older just username passwords is, is a, uh, ultimately a compromise um, because you're, you're using a lower level of security um, to re-authenticate a stronger um, um, system. So you're, you lose ground when you go that way. Uh, next. And so um, what we wanted was to help the processes out there for what to do when a device gets lost or stolen and at the same time maintain the integrity of the account and, and you know, not have to regress to weaker forms of, of uh, re-identification. Next, please. So what we, we found is that one of the more common ways of, of doing identification these days is to um, take advantage of the proof of possession that already exists with physical cards that people already have, things like driver's licenses, passports, and so on, and, um, and, uh, and using that as a way to re-identify people remotely. The problem is um, those systems are have no way, there's no way to judge them, no way to evaluate them. In the same way that I talked earlier about having our biometric testing, um, there is no equivalent way to certify that a certain way of re-authenticating um, somebody doing identity proofing online um, meets a certain bar. So that means that relying parties that are trying to implement these kinds of solutions 
they don't know how to compare systems. They don't know if um, there's enough reliability in one, if there's enough security in another. And so FIDO has taken on the job of providing certification in this area. Next slide, please. So there's really two parts to this. There's the analysis of the, the, um, uh, the document itself. And again, these would be documents from trusted, uh, uh, trusted authorities, could be an employer uh, identity, it could be um, um, state, province, uh, federal government, what have you. And so the first step is to make sure that when the user takes a picture of the uh, identity, uh, and, uh, sorry, of the card and sends it to the lying party, they wanna make sure that it is a legitimate, say, driver's license. And so what the processor needs to do, and these are where we're defining our, our performance criteria, they need to be able to identify certain security features that are built in, figure out what are the types of things someone could do to modify uh, the document and uh, identify those things. Um, we need to have, just like with biometrics, false acceptance and false rejection rates. Um, and again, provide guidelines for relying parties to be able to compare that the document analysis portion um, is of a sufficient level of security and assurance that uh, is necessary. And we also need to build in a set of criteria that allow for geographic flexibility, meaning that um, you could have one test set up by one company dealing with, um, say, uh, um, you know, federal identities from one country and somebody else could be doing it for driver's licenses um, at, a, say, a state level in the U.S. Next. Now, the second part of this is to prove that it's you on the... the Sorry. One more. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> you, you've got to be able to prove that you're the one that just presented that driver's license or, or whatever the document happens to be. And so the second step in the process after you've taken a picture of the document is to take a facing, a, fa a selfie, good Lord, uh, take a selfie. Um, and the idea is to take the selfie and submit it um, along with the document so that the system can do a comparison between the selfie you just took and the face that's on the identity. Um, and again, there's a whole series of criteria that have to be defined here, including things like um, liveness testing. Uh, we need to make sure these days with the sophistication of tools out there for photo editing and whatnot, that um, it is in fact a live person that's standing in front or sitting in front of the camera at the time, and that it is legitimately um, the face that matches the um, what's in the document. And not surprisingly, this, this really is a just in isolation, a form of biometric certification, um, but just put in conjunction with the document processing. Uh, and so we're, we're leveraging the work that we already did in biometric testing to help with this particular aspect of things. Next, please. So um, one of the other areas that comes up on a regular basis is how to ensure that the person using the authenticator has already been proofed in some secure and reliable way. Um, and in addition, how is that binding done in a secure and reliable way? And so right now, FIDO is doing um, research into, or not research, I've got a working group um, that's studying um, what needs to be done in order to create this, this binding between, say, David Turner and David Turner's phone or David Turner's authenticator? Um, how do we make sure that the process for making that binding doesn't get um, compromised during the process? And in addition, what kind of information should be bound to the authenticator so the relying party has certain assurances that the person has been proved properly? We don't have the answers to those yet, but this is an active area of discussion within FIDO today. Next, please. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this in detail. This is a simple timeline of the work that's underway already. The document process uh, analysis is the furthest along um, and we're earlier in the days, uh, sorry, the, the live verification work is, is also underway. The binding work is uh, earliest, but we're hoping to be able to launch a certification for the document uh, authentication testing sometime by the end of the year. Oh, next. So, jumping completely into a new space. Uh, we've looked at the problem of shared secrets and all of the problems that they, they create. And 
one area where this is probably a bigger problem than it is even for individual um, uh, individuals and their own personal passwords is in the IoT space. Next, please. So one of the things about the IoT space is we're talking massive scales, massive alarming number of devices that people want to connect and get online. And, uh, you know, a simple study was done a little while ago about how long does it take to onboard 10,000 IoT devices? And based on how things are done today, that can take over two years. And in many cases, it's not necessarily a secure process, um, it requires a lot of human interaction. And you can imagine that if you had, you know, the, the sorts of numbers we're talking about with shared secrets, how easy it would be to compromise one and then be able to hack all the others. Oh, wait, <laughs> that happened with security cameras. Um, so we already know that this is a legitimate problem. We face this. And so we have the, the, the combined problem of fast onboarding as well as um, secure onboarding. Next, please. So FIDO created a new working group to look at the scenarios associated with um, uh, secure device onboarding um, for IoT devices. After doing extensive market studies and use case analysis, we determined as our initial goal that we were going to focus largely on the industrial and enterprise devices state um, um, areas where the number of devices and the scale of it is, is exceptionally large. And you have the, the problem of um, the installers often needing to be um, what we call untrusted people. So it's, it's, a, it's a contract worker that was hired to you know, plug in routers around a building or install the new smart light bulbs. Uh, the problem is these person are neither trained in security capabilities um, and you don't want to have to trust them with doing any kind of security configuration um, because of course that creates a, a big risk as well. So the first was looking at the, the very large scale uh, applications. The second was recognizing that when you deal with that scale, you also have to deal with um, a whole host of different cloud service platforms, um, tools from Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and others, uh, Honeywell, who have the tools for managing and controlling these devices, um, it's hard for manufacturers to have to produce a device that targets any one of these systems. Ideally, they want to be able to produce a single device that can be bought and used in any environment. We also, in looking at the industrial enterprise scenario, looked at the importance of a secure supply chain. And so part of the uh, FIDO device on board spec includes a means to track a device securely and have it um, have credentials appropriately signed uh, as they're, they're moved through the supply chain. And then lastly, it's important for the, the ability to take devices and move them into new environments as necessary without having to share the secrets that were already embedded with them. You can do a reset and start from scratch in an entirely new uh, environment. Next, please. So, um, the primary benefits that we were looking to provide is the ability to essentially just drop ship a device, turn it on, uh, connect it to network and have it automatically provisioned. All of this with zero touch from the installer so that uh, all they have to do is, is put it where it's supposed to go and turn it on and the rest is done automatically. We wanted this to be very fast as well as secure you get speed partly by not having to have user interaction. Um, pardon me. Um, so that was a very important part of it. Hardware flexibility was an important part of the specification as well. We need to make sure that the processing requirements of dealing with the keys and so on could be handled in very low end devices, um, but was also still robust enough to deal with very high end devices. As I mentioned earlier as well, we need to make sure that um, the solution worked in any cloud or on-premise service. And one of the key aspects of the specification, one of the reasons why um, it's possible for one hardware manufacturer to produce one part and have it work in all uh, scenarios is that we've, been, we've introduced this notion of late binding. So currently, manufacturers frequently have to know what the cloud management environment is going to be. And so the manufacturer has to produce specific hardware um, or configured hardware in advance time of manufacture that work with a particular cloud. 
one of the benefits of the, the FDO specification is that that decision doesn't have to be made until the actual onboarding of the device um, on-prem where it's going to be used. Um, and the last uh, value prop of what we're working on is that there is already an existing open source project. Uh, it's actually been under development for quite a while now. It's under the Linux Foundation in a sub area called um, Linux Edge. Uh, you may still see it called SDO, which was the original name of the spec before uh, FIDO took it on, um, but they're currently moving it to FDO. So secure device on board with the original name, <clears throat> pardon me, and it's now migrating over to be called the uh, FIDO device on board. And this is all available up and running on GitHub now. So oh, next. So walking through the flow here, just to show you how the different components work. Step one, device is manufactured and the keys are provisioned, uh, the private key is provisioned into the device. Step two, device is put in a box, shipped off to the owner. In parallel to that, the registered ownership information is put into a thing called an ownership voucher, which contains the private key that corresponds to uh, the device that you're going to install. That will flow through the supply chain and ultimately end up at the target cloud, the, the end point that is going to be managing this device. So they now have information about every device that they've bought uh, and plan to onboard onto their system. Um, they take that information and they register it with um, what we call a rendezvous server, which is essentially a lookup mechanism, much like DNS. Um, then when the device has been installed, it gets flipped on. The first thing it does is it goes out to the rendezvous server and it looks for its corresponding GUID. So the cloud has provisioned the, the, the goods to the rendezvous server. The, um, a T device gets that from the rendezvous server, but it also gets the address of the uh, target cloud that it's supposed to be configured with. So after it gets it in step four, step five, it actually then goes to the cloud. There's mutual authentication that takes place. So the cloud um, by possession of the certificate proves that it's the right owner and um, to the device, but then the device proves that it's the legitimate device because it provides the matching keys that were provided in the um, uh, ownership voucher at the beginning of the process. And then once that authentication is done and a secure channel is established at point uh, step six and on, that's when the cloud management system takes over, may embed whatever updates it needs to, and um, the FDO process is complete and it then moves on to whatever normal uh, management and processing takes place. Uh, next. Back to you, Andrew. Thanks, David. Uh, so just to start wrapping things up here, um, you know, moving to a passwordless future, or as we say, a, a less password future. Um, you know, we're, again, we're making good progress on this front, um, but what are the things that need to happen for us to get there? And I think a lot of this was exposed in what we talked about today. Um, first of all, we need to replace password logins with biometrics or keys. And this is kind of a behavioral type thing and really usability shift that needs to happen. And frankly, a lot of people are doing it today. So if you're using Face ID or Touch ID on your iPhone or the equivalent on Android, you're not using a password anymore, but you know, usually in that case, it's still a password on the server and it's just functioning as a password manager. But getting people to make that kind of cognitive leap and behavioral leap is very important to start you know, changing learned user behaviors. Um, secondly, and, and perhaps most important, um, frankly, is you know, again, we need to move away from knowledge-based authentication to possession, move towards possession-based authentication. Likewise, you know, the, the very important work we're doing, um, you know, around identity verification and binding is, is key here, which allows us to move to, you know, a, a possession-based uh, model for account creation and identity proofing as well, All right, So when you do that, um, you no longer have the necessity to have a password or a shared secret on a server. And once those two steps are set, you can truly start to replace passwords with FIDO key pairs, right? So when you, you're creating accounts that are not predicated upon using a password, you know, we can really start moving towards this passwordless future that we all want to get to. And you know, the good news is that you know, we're seeing companies do a lot of this today, right? So I showed you eBay before. Um, eBay doesn't necessitate you even having a password. Uh, Docomo, 
uh, NC Docomo has you know, long been a, a leading innovator in FIDO Alliance. They give their customers the option of not having a password as well. Google uh, does, you know, has account recovery mechanisms that are not re uh, dependent on knowledge-based factors. So we're seeing good progress there. Um, you know, more recently, we've seen two very significant announcements. Um, you know, back in June, Apple announced uh, this concept of passkeys, uh, which essentially um, leverages your iCloud keychain, which right now is a very effective password manager, effectively, um, for something called passkeys. Uh, so in this vision, when you go to a site, um, you can, you know, using iCloud or, or your Apple device, you can basically implement the FIDO key pair. And so all that goes on the RP server is a public key instead of a password. Um, and then more recently, uh, Microsoft, of course, announced that they're getting rid of passwords as well. All right, so this is all very positive movement in this direction, um, which points to the fact that really, you know, a lot of this passwordless technology is, is truly, you know, being deployed at scale. Um, and there's more to come as these new technologies start to permeate um, devices and operating system, systems as consumers and, and enterprises refresh um, their devices. So that's our future. Um, you know, FIDO Alliance is really the body um, where all this discussion is happening. Um, we think we're the future of user authentication. Um, you know, as we, we, we've talked about all these points already. You know, FIDO provides a stronger approach, a faster approach. Uh, we maintain user privacy. Uh, it's very convenient. Um, it fits an array of use cases. It reflects the industry's backing. And perhaps most important, um, it's in market today. Right, both from a device standpoint, and we're seeing more and more leading service providers use FIDO today. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all um, for your attention today. Uh, Alan, thank you for having us. And David, thanks for co-presenting with me um, today. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having us. We appreciate the opportunity to speak. It's a pleasure. And wow, you guys have been busy, haven't you? So it's, uh, it's a lot there, <laughs> a lot to take in. I really enjoy that as, a, as someone who's uh, been working in in all for, 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 for many, many years. That was a fantastic presentation, so thank you. I can't let you can't let you go without you kind of mentioning, you're running an event in a couple of weeks time, I believe. Can you share a little bit more about that and how our community can can, can, can join in with that? Yeah, Alan, thanks so much for, for raising that. So um, you know, a lot of FIDO's focus, obviously we wanna see, we'll continue to evolve the technology, but more and more of our focus is on market education and enablement. And a key part of that is um, a conference series that we've launched called Authenticate. Um, so we run virtual summits every quarter, but also we're having our first in-person Authenticate conference. It's actually a hybrid event, so you can attend in person or remotely, October 18th to 20th. Uh, for those who want to attend in person, it's in Seattle, Washington, or you can attend remotely as well, anywhere. Um, AuthenticateCon.com is the website to get more information. But it's basically three days of um, insights, case studies, perspectives from companies that are you know, deploying FIDO at scale or companies that are innovating and providing new solutions um, that can be leveraged in a variety of use cases. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for, from Andrew and from David from the FIDO Alliance. And that's it from us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Al.